First, let's take a look at saltatory conduction. We've examined how a wave of depolarization travels in unmyelinated fibers. We've seen that the wave of depolarization begins at the dendrite end, moves along the axon as a steady wave. In a myelinated neuron, Schwann cells with a myelin sheath act as insulators, and ions are only allowed in at the gaps or the nodes of Ranvier. So the wave of depolarization still begins at the dendrite end, but it actually skips the part where the myelin sheath is, where the Schwann cells are, and it jumps past it. So we have depolarization only occurring at the nodes of Ranvier. This actually results in a much quicker wave of depolarization so that the whole wave travels the length of a myelinated neuron much more quickly than it does an unmyelinated neuron. Remember that myelinated neurons are found mainly in the peripheral nervous system, whereas unmyelinated neurons are found in substantial portions of the central nervous system. This means that impulses leaving the brain and spinal cord actually can travel to their desti destination very quickly, while the unmyelinated neurons that make up the gray matter carry impulses substantially more slowly than myelinated neurons do. The absence of the myelin sheath actually means that there is a greater density of unmyelinated neurons in portions of the brain and spinal cord. And this allows for tighter packing of unmyelinated neurons and results in many more possible cross connections. So while there's a sacrifice in speed, there's the potential for a tremendous number of interconnections. To get a sense of the difference in relative speed, impulses travel along myelinated neurons at a speed of about 200 meters per second while they only travel along unmyelinated neurons at a speed of about one meter per second. The second neuron phenomenon we'll take a look at is the all or none response to stimulus. In order for the neuron to begin its wave of depolarization, a certain level of stimulus must be reached. The required intensity of the stimulus for depolarization varies from person to person. If this threshold is not reached, the wave of depolarization will not take place. A greater stimulus than that required to initiate the wave of depolarization does not increase the action potential. The action potential is still plus 40 millivolts. However, a greater stimulus may give rise to a greater number of impulses in a given period of time. So in summary, if you have a stimulus that's sufficient to initiate a wave of depolarization, it will occur and it will reach plus 40 millivolts as it depolarizes. If the stimulus is insufficient to initiate a wave of depolarization, the wave of depolarization will not occur. So either the stimulus is sufficient and we get depolarization to plus 40 millivolts, or the stimulus is insufficient and we get no depolarization at all. Thus we call this the all or none response. The stimulus has to reach a certain threshold or minimum level in order for the depolarization to occur. If the stimulus is stronger than the threshold, this does not influence the degree to which depolarization occurs. What it does change is the number of impulses that are generated in the same period of time. So looking at A and B, can you answer this question? Which one of the two images that we see was the result of a greater stimulus? Was it A or was it B? If you said B, you're correct the stimulus was greater and might translate into a much sharper pin prick to your finger as opposed to A which might have been a very light pin prick to your finger. The third phenomenon we'll take a look at is hypernegativity. Antagonistic muscles such as the biceps and triceps work in opposition to each other. When the biceps is contracting the triceps are relaxed and vice versa. This is necessary for coordinated movement. If both muscles contracted simultaneously no movement would occur. The nervous system makes coordinated movement possible by making some neurons hypernegative. For example, when the biceps muscle contracts, the neurons that stimulate the triceps muscle are hypernegative. Potassium, a positive ion, would normally be inside the cell and regular resting potential would be maintained. In hypernegativity, potassium is removed from the cell, making the interior even more negative. 
Because of this hypernegativity, a greater stimulus is needed to depolarize the neuron. It's less likely to depolarize and the triceps muscle is less likely to contract, which is totally desirable if you want the biceps muscle to be contracting. So in this way, hypernegativity allows for coordinated muscle movement. In this video, we've looked at three neuron phenomena, saltatory conduction, all or none response, and hypernegativity. In the next video, we'll take a look at synaptic transmission.